Get in the shower, Mabby. Renamed myself. Is <laughs> that you, Jamie? <laughs> Can hear you. How is everyone? So exciting! So many people have joined. Um, I'll just start by introducing myself. Um, my name is Emma. I'm a birth and postpartum doula living in Sydney, and I'm also a volunteer for Home Birth New South Wales, um, looking after the memberships. So um, I had my own experience with home birth uh, about three and a half years ago, and that's really what opened my eyes to this kind of realm of possibilities with the potential of what we can achieve um, in birth, and particularly what we can achieve when we're supported in that physiological process. So I could talk about this subject for days, and I absolutely love seeing um, you know, the men in the birth space and seeing the even the one. Is that word? Yes. Okay. One has to mute. <laughs> mute yourselves. Um, even the ones that have been apprehensive about um, what they might do to support their partner and just seeing them really step into their element and shine. Um, and it's such a beautiful thing to witness for me and really um, lights me up. So I have to read a little bit of an intro, some housekeeping. So um, welcome to our Home Birth New South Wales webinar. We're celebrating Home Birth Awareness Week this week and we're really excited to be hosting a week of incredible virtual events for all of our followers just to give you some insights into um, various aspects of planning for your potential upcoming birth um, and your motherhood journey. So you can see all of the events that we've done um, earlier in the week and the ones to come tomorrow and on Saturday um, on our website, which is homebirthnsw.org.au um, and just click on the events tab and it's all there. So Home Birth New South Wales is a not-for-profit organisation um, run by committed, passionate volunteers who are dedicated to educating and supporting women who wish to give birth at home. Our mission is to enable improved accessibility and affordability to home birth services in New South Wales and Australia wide for all families that want it. Home Birth New South Wales provides families information and support in their pregnancy and birth journey, including linking women to an incredible list of home birth midwives and other services, including doulas, birth photographers, um, who all support home birth families all the time. Uh, Home Birth Awareness Week is an international event where we aim to shine a light on the safety and the incredible benefits obtained by birthing at home and support those who are seeking home birth by welcome, welcoming them into our local and statewide communities. Home birth is a very safe option for low risk women who want to have a more natural birth um, and reduce the risk of birth interventions. So birthing at home with a midwife in attendance is as safe as birthing in hospital 
for a mother and baby, but also reduces the risk of maternal morbidity. Home birth reduces the chances of severe perineal tear tearing, cesarean sections, instrumental birth, inductions, epidural use, and increases likelihood of physiological vaginal birth. Um, while providing you with the comfort and safety of your own home um, and a known to you skilled care provider in your midwife. Um, as you'll see in the events of this week, if you've tuned in to any others, um, that there are many positives to birthing at home. So hopefully these sessions will help provide more information um, for anyone that's interested in home birth. Uh, don't forget to enter our raffle, which is just $20 um, per ticket, and you can be in the running to win one of three prize packs valued at $1,500. These include birth photography, doula training, postpartum meal packs, lactation consultants, childbirth education, books, and more. Um, that's also on our website, homebirthnewsouthwales.org.au. Um, we really hope you enjoy the sessions. Please feel free to type any comments or questions in the chat box as we go. Um, and if they're directed at the guys that I'll be interviewing, um, I'll ask them. Otherwise, I'll some questions at the end. Um, we also have a few questions that came through on the socials, um, which I'll cover as well. Um, also, just by being here today, um, you're able to access a $50 discount voucher from Active Truth, who's a sponsor for Home Birth Awareness Week events. Um, if it's a mainly guys here, you might not be interested, but if there are some women on, then um, I'll share a QR code at the end, which will give you um, that discount. Okay. Um, so just if anyone's jumped on um, while I was going through that, my name is Emma, um, and I'm a birth and postpartum doula in Sydney. And today we're going to be chatting about home birth from a partner's perspective. And what that means to me is... Um, communicating with men and helping them to understand that they have got everything that they need inside of them to be able to support their partner in a loving way. And I think going through this, hopefully I'm going to help some of you remember that this is just another, um, just another normal event that occurs throughout your life and there's really nothing to be afraid of. So um, I think... Maybe I will just start by introducing um, my guests. I've got roped in <laughs> two of the husbands <laughs> from other um, Home Birth New South Wales volunteers. So we've got um, Sam, who is Josie's husband, and Matt, who is Jamie's husband. Um, since you're first on my screen, Matt, would you like to just introduce yourself and maybe um, describe a little bit about your birth experience? Um, I was hoping to be just asking me questions and then I don't have to freestyle. <laughs> um, a, maybe just, um, you know, mention how many births you've supported um, yeah. and what you thought about that. Okay. Um, well, I've got two older daughters, which both were hospital births. And then um, we have uh, two boys with Jamie and... One was a hospital birth, which really set her on this whole path of um, being a doula and doing all this stuff because she just saw all the flaws uh, in the system and just like afterwards when she was reflecting on things, just saw like so many gaps and just saw that there's really a need there for everybody to have better support. So that set her on this path and then she, you know, decided she wanted to do a home birth and you know, just gave it a crack and see what happened. So, um, but having done that, it was only one home birth, you know, it it went reasonably well, I would say. And um, yeah, I'd definitely do it again. Yeah. Um, the, the hospital thing, it's just like, um, uh, how do you describe it? It's like, uh, it's really like a baby factory. They just get you and it's, it's the same process all the time. They don't give a shit. You know, they just send you on your way and um, it's it's their way. They don't really care about what you want or what your needs are. Um, when Jamie was in there before she asked for a tea and uh, and then when they came back with it, she said, oh, can I get a can I get a milk? And she's like, it's not a hotel. Like, what do you want? So, you know, they don't really care that much. Whereas home birth, you're surrounded by everybody that wants to be there. They want to help. And uh, it was just a 
significantly better uh, experience all around. It's more calm and relaxed. And, uh, and you've got all your creature comforts. You can have the people you want there as well. You don't have to be restricted, especially at this time uh, with what's going on. So I think it's definitely better. Yeah. So having had the experience of um, supporting Jamie in the hospital setting and at home, how did you feel, um, like, how can you compare the two, like being in hospital, obviously I'm assuming you might've felt like you're not the expert in the room. Um, it's very overwhelming with the bright lights, the same as what a woman would experience. How do you um, compare the two of supporting Jamie in the home and in the hospital? Mm. Got to be more hands-on at home, whereas at the hospital, like I said, they they've got the way that they want things done. They they want you to get in there, and then they they won't listen to much of what you have to say. It's it's they really just want to do it their own way and in their own time frames. They don't just let things happen naturally. They just want to rush you in, get it over and done with, get to the next person, um, and you. you you know, you kind of don't want to ask for anything because you don't want to be a nuisance. Whereas, you know, um, at home, you just can do whatever it is that you want to do. And, you know, Jamie just relaxed while I pretty much took care of everything. She just had to worry about, you know, um, being comfortable and letting us know when the baby was coming. <laughs> that was pretty much it. So um, I, I think it, it's, it's better because it's more relaxed and do things at your own pace. You're not rushing anything. You're not having somebody telling you what you have to do and when you have to do it or why. You just wait for things. And then, you know, when the baby's coming, it's coming. Yeah. It's ready to rock. Yeah. Baby's coming, it's coming. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Um, I'll circle back throughout when I have questions. Um, sure. So you can go ahead and mute yourself. Um, Sam, hi. <laughs> Would you like to yourself and um yeah maybe just touch on um the experiences with birth that you've had um <clears throat> sure um hello everyone uh, i'm sam i'm the partner of josie who's one of the volunteers at home birth new south Wales. um my experience is slightly different to matt's what i didn't we didn't have um i really have had no uh uh, experience in hospital at all when it comes to the birth world. It's all been at home, even, you know, um, interventional wise, any kind of, the, the first time around there was, we did a few scans and stuff, but I think after that, it, that changed, even that was kind of scaled back as well. So my experience is I have two, two boys and, uh, both were born at home and they were fantastic experiences so i it, it's interesting because i i hear people say to me you know um you're very uh brave to have a child at home you know to not have it in a hospital setting and i find that strange because my experience has been so good um you know the our first was pretty much just me and josie for the for the whole time you know, it was only really right at the kind of business end of things was our midwife, uh, Janine, showed up because she was at, I think she was at a conference or something in <laughs> Sydney and I had called her to say, oh, I think, um, I think we're kind of progressing, we're moving on. And she was like, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. But I think because it was the first birth and she was like, oh, I'll get a coffee and I think... <laughs> so it was we I think we were like further along the line than than we realized um so my experience has, re has been really good from it so I don't know I'm not entirely sure what your question was that's okay I yeah I think um just to get a, an understanding of where you're at in terms of your experience with home birth and it sounds like you had um, two really positive experiences and there's really nothing negative to talk about. And I think, you know, your situation is, um, is the case with a lot of people like, and, you know, you mentioned how um, some people would say, well, you know, you're brave for having, um, you know, 
a child, a baby at home. And I feel like having witnessed what I have in the hospital system and in home birth, I think, wow, it's actually the reverse. Like I do feel that women need to be and partners need to be very brave um, heading into the hospital. Mm. You know? And um, it sounds like, you know, more of Matt's um, experience with well- I mean, you, you'll know, Emma, right? But what's the the percentages of, say, uh, women who are having a, a second child who decide they want to have a home birth? Is that predominantly because they had a, a hospital birth first, or is that, or or is it normally people go straight into home birth? Yeah, I believe. Um, I don't know the exact stats, but I do believe that women who have a negative experience the first time kind of go one or two ways. They um, will go back to the same provider, um, feeling like the provider maybe saved them, um, mm-hmm. even though it was a very negative or traumatic experience. Um, and the other way is like looking for ways to not make the same mistakes again. Um, and I think when you kind of are open to exploring different paths and you know, in my experience, I felt like everything was an option and I never ruled out anything. And I just wanted to understand, you know, what exactly are my options? I think there are women out there like that, that go, hang on a minute, here's, you know, here's a great option. Um, you know, having a home birth midwife come to you your whole pregnancy, especially when you have, you know, maybe other children makes it a lot easier. And so, yeah, I think, um, a lot of women would would switch, you know, maybe the second or third time. Um, I guess our hope is that <laughs> women choose to birth at home for the first time. Um, so basically they don't stuff it up in hospital. That would be my hope, you know, that we can spread more awareness about first time mums birthing at home. So thank you, Sam. I'll circle back with some questions as we go. Um, so I wanted to just talk a little bit about um, firstly the environment and I think um, you know just trying to gauge why most people are here is potentially because they are planning a home birth um, soon and would like some practical things around the space and what to do so I'm assuming that most most people here um, have got a home birth plan on the horizon, but if not, and you're completely new to home birth, just write in the chat box, you know, just love to know where you're at so I can sort of tailor the conversation depending on where you're at. Um, So the first uh, point, oh, hello, (laughs) planning a home birth after cesarean. There you go. So it's a second time mum that potentially had a, negative experience in the hospital and is wanting something different so great choice choosing home birth um so i think the most important thing for um men to remember in the space is that what gets the baby in gets the baby out so in physiological birth we really need to be thinking the whole time about the hormone oxytocin because that's really the driver of labor so when you think about what gets the baby in gets the baby out it's really easy to think oh yep I can be intimate with my partner um you know I've got lots of experience with that I know what turns are on um you know and and what sort of a setting does that look like when we are wanting to have an intimate moment so the first thing that comes to mind is obviously the dim lights you know maybe you have soft music playing um, the atmosphere is really calm people are whispering so you sort of bring in you know the the more physical elements to the room but also um, from an emotional perspective and just loving on her um, and you know I think it can be really overwhelming for people if they haven't seen their partner go through um, labor before or a, a physiological labor where there's no medication um, things can get really wild and, you know, can take turns and you might um, not recognise some of the things that she's doing and it might seem a bit overwhelming. Um, but just always coming back to remembering that you know her better than anyone else in that space. Um, yeah. 
and just loving. <laughs> um, so if you're thinking maybe how can I be most useful in the space, what I would suggest is just cultivate intimacy. So I absolutely love seeing, um, you know, men have got like, such strength and you know beautiful strong hands and just holding her hands and connecting with her you know eye gazing or just a um chest tight chest hug <laughs> um and you know whispering you know you're so amazing you're incredible you know and really just holding that gentle and loving and tenderness But also, if that's not you <laughs> and that's not um, the dynamic of your relationship, just think about when you are being intimate or when you are being romantic, like what kind of things you would normally do. Um, and I think that this should um, come very naturally because it's hard to think when you're not in the, um, in the experience or how will I be, how will I act? Um, because there's so many unknowns, but once you're in there, you really just need to trust that you will love on her and take care of her. You know better than anyone. Um, so, in labour, um, it is very difficult to communicate because women tend to go very inward and you know have single pointed focus, and they might be using all of their um, energy on just focusing on breathing and getting through each wave and then resting in between. So, communication can actually be really hard because you're like okay, I don't know what she wants and she's not telling me what she wants. So if you can just, you know, maybe intuition might be, um, you know, for a lot of guys kind of a foreign concept, but you definitely have some instinct. So I always think to myself in the birth space, what can I do to make this woman more comfortable right now? Um, and then usually a thought will pop into my head, like she needs to be left alone, she needs space, or she needs, um, you know, a reassuring touch, or she needs her hands to be held and to be told that she's beautiful and that, you know, she's amazing, she's incredible and she's doing it. Just keep up to go back to my notes. <laughs> um, so, and even just improvising, you know, as you go along and thinking, you know, is she hot? Can I get her a cold flannel? You know, maybe put some peppermint oil on, put that on her head or the back of her neck, or, um, you know, maybe she's been in this position for a little while. Can I move her to a different space? So if she's not been in water for about two hours, um, she's just, you know, been moving around from the bed to the lounge and the floor, maybe suggest, you know, hopping in the shower and having some hot water on her back or, sitting on the toilet for some time um, and just offering really gentle suggestions in a way that would be like, um, you know, um, do you feel like you might be more comfortable in the shower right now? Not like, um, let's get you in the shower. So everything always remains um, the woman's choice, what she does. Um, and so we're not like coming in and dominating anything and telling her what to do, but just giving her subtle hints and reminding her, hey, um, hot water's an option, or even just um, heating up a wheat pack. If she's laying in bed and you brought you a wheat pack, you know, just thinking of things so that she doesn't have to ask. Um, <laughs> So on the practical side of things, um, because birth can be like a particularly long um, experience, like in, in some cases, a first time mom may, may be in labor for 24 hours, it's really hard to stay fully present for the entire time. So I, I do feel um, with the birth partner that it's really important to not kind of play that um, role of hero and wanting to be, um, you know, the strong one and, and get through it because right at the end um, of labor, in the second stage of labor, when she's, you know, bearing down and ready to push, like she has got absolutely nothing left in the tank and she needs you to be that strength. So in early labor, if she's fine, just sleep. Um, 
when labor starts heading more active, you know, you're doing practical things to support her, but also being mindful about um, if you've had a shower, have you eaten? Um, she might not be eating, but you definitely need to eat a meal. Obviously drinking water, using the bathroom when you need to, um, and not feeling like you can't leave her side. Um, obviously it's different if she's saying, don't leave me or like, don't make that food. It smells and it's like offensive. So obviously you have to read the room, but I think definitely um, looking after your own needs, particularly in the early labor phase, because, um, you know, labor can kind of start and stop when it's early and you don't want to spend, you know, um, from 10 p.m. till 6 a.m. awake when, you know, you could have otherwise been resting. Um, so I think um, most, <laughs> most women would probably agree that having um, any kind of like distractions in the space, like when um, I remember my partner in my home birth started using his phone and I just wanted to throw it at his head. <laughs> um, I found that so annoying. So just being really mindful and respectful of what's going on. Um, and though, you know, maybe just putting the phone away, you don't really need to communicate with anyone else other than obviously your support team, midwives, stores, um, with what's going on. And I often find like just leaving the room and, you know, sending a quick text and then coming back into the space so that it's just, you know, not another distraction. Um, so I think I'll, I'll go through the positioning. So having, um, you know, a partner, obviously a nice, big, strong man, it's really, um, I just find that so supportive, having that strength. So when um, the woman's reaching active labor or heading towards transition, just being held in that physical sense, like, you know, almost um, having the weight, like having your weight supported and really sinking down into the pelvis and swaying and, you know, slow dancing and all of this kind of stuff and just helping that um, the body and the baby move down. Um, so there's like kind of a balance between being really hands-on and being hands-off and giving space. But I think it just comes back to, um, you know, using that instinct and feeling into what can I do right now that's going to support, you know, this labor. Um, and also I, I don't feel like you need to know everything and have um, a a doula qualification to be able to support a woman. I think that you really just need to trust yourself and know, um, I've said this a few times, but really know that you know this person better than anyone else that's coming into that space and you know what will make her feel most comfortable. Um, so <laughs> some um, physical hacks that you can use um, that will boost oxytocin, these are, um, points shared by Jane Hardwick Collings and I always discuss this um, with the dads when you know we talk about birth preparation um, because it's often a long time between like when the doula would arrive um, and then when the midwife would arrive and so there is that sense of responsibility of doing something so I think these points could be useful. Um, so boosting oxytocin, eye gazing lovingly, um, just reminding her um, to breathe so slowing breathing down um, and mimicking the breathing so that she can copy I always say take a deep breath in so deepening the exhale um, deepening the inhale lengthening the exhale um, breathing through the nose as long as possible and just um, helping her find that single pointed focus on the breath so by guiding her that's it breathe in Excellent, breathe out. <laughs> um, and I can remember distinctly my um, partner would put his hand on my shoulder and say, relax, and then my whole body would just melt like that. It was incredible. Um, and once he figured out it was working, he just kept doing it every time. And I was like, don't stop. <laughs> um, so 
even just guiding them through relaxing the face, facial muscles, especially, um, you know, the jaw, lips and the throat relaxes the um, pelvis, vulva and the cervix. So that is going to help everything soften and open and dilate. Um, and then doing a body tension check. Um, so purposefully like relaxing tight muscles. So sometimes I might um, ask the woman to really um, tighten her pelvic floor and then exhale and, and let it soften and then tighten again and let it soften. And then again, a third time on that third time, it really lengthens out. So if you can see that she's clenching her butt or standing on her tippy toes, just remember ground um, feet into the earth, tense, the butt and the pelvic floor and release. So, you know, just giving her that awareness of, oh yeah, I'm holding tension in my bottom. A lot of women will hold tension in their shoulders once the surge comes to an end. And so it's all, almost this um, hangover of the contraction that there's tension up here. So, you know, even just putting, standing behind and putting the hands on the shoulders and relax your shoulders and breathe. Um, because you don't want you know her to be in a situation where she's going into the next wave already tense um she needs to be completely loose and floppy um so yeah just keeping an eye out for yeah <laughs> jaw clenching or squeezing fists or tense shoulders or clenching her butt um make sound on exhale and low tones so in um, labor sometimes if um, the woman um, or your partner sounds like she's getting um, quite high-pitched uh, sounds it can be um, a sign of adrenaline creeping in so if you start hearing her like more on the um, <laughs> sort of what do you call that wavelength <laughs> um to just take it down and make some low noises. So you could just mimic again for her, like, hmm, you know, humming um, or the horse's breath like that. Um, some women really are able to do that well. And that's, um, you know, a super effective way of helping uh, not hold tension in the pelvic floor as well. Um, so the maintaining the eye gaze and um, the ventral hug, like chest to chest, full frontal hug for a full minute. Um, and this is just a really good way to boost oxytocin. So if you notice that she's in active labor, um, but she's experiencing a labor stall, so the contractions are not as sort of long and strong and regular, like they may have faded a little bit or don't seem so intense. Um, you know, then you would be like, all right, now I really need to bring the oxytocin back into this space. You might be kissing her, you know, um, like caressing her or whatever you would normally do um, that she finds like very nurturing and very loving or that chest to chest hug um, and words of reassurance. And obviously just tell her that you love her and that she's amazing. Um, so at some point in, um, the labor women will shift the focus inward. So they completely shut off um, the neocortex and they're really in this sort of primal mammalian brain. And this is what I was sort of mentioning where communication then becomes um, really hard. So um, in this time, it would be best to like not speak or ask any questions um, and just gentle touch, kissing, um, you know, deep pressure on the lower back and hip squeezes if she likes those or any other little comfort measures that, um, you know, that you've heard of or that you can think of or that you feel called to do. Um, but yeah, and at a point where she really goes inward, questions are almost impossible to answer because you just are not in your rational thinking brain. If it was like a question of, oh, would you like to stay in the pool or get out of the pool? It's too much. You can't answer that. You need to be like really guided. <laughs> um, so a lot of the time, if I notice a labor stall um, and I'm in somebody's birth space, I would always either remove myself or send them into the bathroom or the bedroom with the lights down low um, and just say, you know, 
kissing and being intimate and resting um, would be best until you know that oxytocin is flowing and that labor picks up again um, so don't be afraid if you do have um, a midwife or a doula there to make a suggestion if you notice a labor stall like hey let's head into the bedroom um, for some alone time and everyone will be like great idea <laughs> uh, so um I always find if the woman's upright just to keep um, that variation in the pelvis and keeping everything sort of swaying and moving like figure eights with the hips, the slow dancing that I mentioned before, um, if she can you know, drop down to the ground and you can have support her weight um, and help her sway and wiggle and move, um, all of this variation in the pelvis helps that baby's head really come down um, they need to kind of do a corkscrew manoeuvre in the pelvis. So you want to have um, this structure kind of shifting and moving as much as possible. Um, when she's finished having a wave, <laughs> she might be in the, in the birth pool or on the floor, leaning on the lounge or on the bed, but just remind her, just close her eyes and just breathe and take the rest um, so that it's... She's getting, you know, this almost like micro sleeps in between um, contractions just to restore some of that energy. Um, encourage the shower or the bath or the birth pool or, um, you know, whatever you can think of. Um, if you feel like she's at a point of crisis, I usually find moving um, to a different, like trying something else can help just boost her um confidence a little bit because it is very really easy to get sort of stuck um you know in a moment of crisis so on the point of um like a crisis in, of confidence um what can often happen in a birth space if you have um a, a birth partner that has a um Obviously, you do have an emotional attachment to this person, but it can be very easy for the woman to draw in her partner into um, what's called a sympathy loop. So for a long time saying, I can't do this anymore. I need pain relief. Take me to the hospital. Um, and so like ordinarily, unless there was some kind of medical emergency, ordinarily, if this was happening, I would, I would realise that that was a crisis of confidence and that she needed more support to realize that she could um, carry on. I think I have seen in the past, some partners kind of go, oh my God, she's not coping. She needs pain relief, she needs to go to the hospital. And it's like, you know, she doesn't, it's okay. This is the first crisis. And what we're gonna do um, is just be with her in birth and support her to come out the other side of it because it's just something that happens in most labors. Um, and, you know, usually it would happen at the point of transition, which is really normal, but it can happen earlier, particularly if there's a really long labor. So just be mindful if she does start saying that she can't do it anymore, um, doesn't want to do it anymore, and wants to go to hospital. You don't need to say, um, no, we're not, we're not going to go to hospital, we're not going to do that, but just say, okay, you know, let's try X, Y, Z, let's try the TENS machine, let's try the heat pack, let me massage you. And really just reassuring her about how incredible she is and that she got through 100% of the waves so far and she can get through the next. Um, yes, is there any, um, oh, I might just go back to, um, Matt and Sam for a couple of questions now because we're nearly out of an hour. Um, so Matt, can you remember um, what tools you used to support Jamie when she was in labour and potentially if she did have um, a moment of crisis, what helped get her through that? Uh, pretty much everything you said. We just had a list of everything and try everything till something worked. So the hip squeezes was really good. Um, sometimes standing behind her and sort of just taking a little pressure 
uh, of a belly, you know, you just lift up a little bit um, just to give her a, a, a bit of a break because it's all just dragging on. So um, that was helpful. The being prepared as well is something that's um, it's handy. It, it just makes things easier rather than going, oh, I've got to go do this or I've got to try this or I'm not ready for it. And then, you know, if everything's set up, ready to go, like, um she knew what um, incense she wanted um, in the diffuser. You know, she set up candles where she wanted them. So when it was getting to that time, it was just run around, light all the candles, you know, diffusers ready to go, just switch it on. Um, the, you know, have the heat packs and the cold packs ready to go because you don't know which one you're going to need. Um, the uh, shower is a good idea, especially if you've got a, um one of those detachable ones where you can move it around um i found that was handy uh well it was handy in the at the hospital because then we could move it around to um sore points and sort of use it as a bit of a massager but then when we're at home we just had the warm pool so we use the um just a cup and sort of you know splashed it on her as well but um i don't ask what the name of the thing was but uh rebozo um so we use use that as well um quite a bit but um just be prepared really and and you can even practice things like the swaying you said as well like the light dancing the light touching not not everybody the same thing like you you were saying with the the shoulder um she liked that sort of thing as well but um we just tried everything through the pregnancy just to do it through uh, mostly stuff we learned from hypnobirthing and um, um, just tried it all out and seen what happens. But there, there was something I was doing every time and it just didn't help, but I was trying it each time just to see. And then eventually that was the thing. It was the only thing then um, that would work, but, you know, I had to try all these other things first and, you know, it was just trial and error, but as you go through the stages, the same things won't keep working either. So it's good to have a lot of uh, options as well. Yeah, definitely having um, yeah, a partner that is a doula and being sort of schooled on things that you can do like the Reposo. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and obviously having that sort of higher level of knowledge about the hypnobirthing tools and things like that. Um, would have really equipped you well for birth. I can remember yeah. um, wanting my partner to really act like a doula for me. And I realize now that it's just completely different roles and where, um, you know, where his strength lay was in really holding space for me and witnessing me and loving me. And that was, you know, enough. And I'm sure Jamie feels the same. And all that extra stuff on top <laughs> really would have helped get us through a long labor. Yeah, well, it was good. We had a doula as well because, you know, she was she's a doula, but she's a horrible patient. Uh, but um, we had a doula too. So um, I saw one of the questions was about older kids as well. So it was handy. We got the tag team. We had a couple other people around too. Like I've got uh, said, I've got older daughters. So they helped us out. Um, with the uh, with Maverick, he's the older of the boys, and um, the um, having the doula being able to switch. So, you know, the doula was good. Jamie uh, picked her because she was like really tough love. Like, I'm going to give you what you want and need. I'm not going to just give in to your in the heat of the moment what you want me to tell you, uh, sort of thing. She's like, nope, this is how it's going to happen, and. Uh, you know, a bit of tough love. So she'd take over for a bit, then that would give me a bit of a break. I think that was one of the uh, questions as well. But you, you need to try not to overwhelm yourself by trying to do everything because you're just going to burn out and then you're not going to be there when it matters. So you need to give yourself a couple of minutes here and there, just, you know, go outside and get some fresh air, take a breather, get a cold drink for yourself, relax when you can. Um, and, uh, and then you said it before that um, when they they just get to the point where they're, you know, they've got no gas left in the tank and they're ready to give up. That's pretty much when you you need to be there because everything up until there's 
you know, you can come and go. But after that point, that's where she needs to be supported the most and push through. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, women, and it's, it's such an intuitive, instinctive, primal um, process, especially the physiological birth at home, um, you can feel into everything that's going on. And there's so many layers to the experience. Like I almost like had, um, you know, was in another dimension with what I could see, feel and hear and know. And so I kind of felt the, um, in my experience, my midwife wasn't there and I had an accidental free birth and I um, could feel my partner's um, nerves and apprehension at that moment. And so, you know, I was like instructing him on what would then happen, but I imagine the same um, would be if your partner was really fatigued and wasn't fully present because they were like, I can barely keep my eyes open, you know, and how um, the experience of just feeling unsupported, even though um, you might be there in the physical sense, are you really connected? You know, are you really there on the energetic level? Um, because if you're not, the woman feels that sense of abandonment. Um, and I have had this, you know, happen with a client before whose partner had a um, hyperglycemic episode. Um, it actually did impact the labor because everything stopped and the baby didn't descend even though she was fully dilated. So um, like don't underestimate the importance of rest and self-care um, because you your role is so, so important. You know, I can't stress that enough. So yeah, I'm glad that you've backed me up on this. <laughs> yeah definitely it's it's handy you, you need to have a plan too so uh seems like sam's got the the right idea as well they you know didn't know any anything different so it, it was the best thing but it really is there's, there's not you know there's not really too many negatives i would say um from it and being calm as well i think that's the way to go um I was just having a look at some photos of the birth and just seeing all the people sitting around and everybody's just quiet. The lights are dim. We had um, like the fairy lights you put up for Christmas. We hung those around just, and that was our main source of the light in the room um, amongst with the candles. So everything just felt calm. And then like, we've got the diffuser for the incense too. She liked lavender, um, you know, to help her calm down as well. But we moved from, from the, the pool out to the lounge room, into the bedroom, just try different rooms for different atmospheres. Cause like you said, you can sort of feel the tension. So sometimes you've got to move uh, to a different room and try different stuff. You know, she did try the sitting on the toilet. <laughs> she, uh, she has PTSD when she goes to our back bathroom. Cause she remembered it was like, she went straight from there to the pool, bang, baby's out. So, you know, it almost happened in the bathroom. <laughs> That's so funny. Thank you so much, Matt, for sharing. That's really, really helpful. I'm sure um, the guys that are present really appreciate hearing your perspective. Um, so Sam, I wanna ask you the same question, um, particularly because I feel like you were alone for quite a long time um, and probably majority of the labor, it sounds like the first time um and potentially the second time um as well so um can you remember what tools you use to support Josie um or you know if you can't what is kind of your memory of how you felt in the situation um so they're two very different experiences the first one so the second one was was a lot more. I I understood the stages mm. a lot more. You know, in the first one, it was kind of it felt quite fast and um, not overwhelming, but but um, it's just for, you know it's full on in a good way. Um, but the second one, I, I I could I could identify the stages a lot more, and like what Matt was saying is like. You know, sometimes you do something on one stage and that worked and then we'd be transitioning and then you try that again. And it's like, no, 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 don't do that. And so you're having to kind of, you know, assess and adjust or whatever. 
the first one, um, in terms of like tools, I don't really, I don't really know. I mean, you know, what was what was really good was the the flannel on the the cold flannel on the head. That one was really really good, and really much later on in the process was like you know head kisses and all that kind of stuff. Um, one of the things that I would say is about having a plan which is good like what Matt was saying you know to, to when you're in a state where it's a little bit more you know pre-pregnancy uh, sorry pre-birth where you can organize and, and chat about the different things and so you've got kind of like a list that you can go through because on the day it's kind of too late you know you have things that you can try in the moment but you kind of need to have those I think you kind of need to have those things kind of spelled out at times because like yeah. you were saying you don't really sometimes you're not going to get an answer yeah and, you know and, if you ask a question it's not really the time to do that um so another thing it depends if you're having a pool is in my experience would be to kind of get it at least somewhat already filled because <laughs> It okay. takes longer than you think yeah, to fill I, up. Um, as soon as labour starts, my advice on the pool would be set up the pool, like pump it up. You want that pool to be really firm. Remember the line art needs to go in the pool as well. Um, and then you can fill it with hot only. So just half halfway hot only because, you know, that'll cool down or you can add cold to it to cool it down. Um, and also if you don't have um, a hot water tank with a large capacity, you can just empty out some of the hot and it'll have, have some time to replenish. So yeah, I'm glad that you brought that up because it's really important. My birth pool was empty when I gave birth um, and I still, I'm holding a grudge about it. <laughs> so like, it's better to- um, Yeah, because it, it was taking a while and there was like even getting to a point, it's like, well, she wants to get in now, but it's not really like where it needs to be at. And then I was like thinking about the structural integrity of the floor and whether that was going to hold the kind of volume of water that was going in it, you know, stupid things like that. Um, <laughs> like if you had have considered you know um beforehand like the structural integrity of the floor it wouldn't have really been a concern in um in labor and it's absolutely fine even in apartments it's about 480 kilos i think um when it's full or half full so yeah um your floor probably won't collapse with that weight <laughs> Um, but yeah, just going through during pregnancy and saying, okay, what do you think you might want um, in these stages? Just typing a list, even if it's just random thoughts or a bit of a word map. How do you want the um, space to feel? Like some women really want to have um, music playing that's more dancey and other women really would like to be in a spiritual Zen meditative space, um, you know, and, and obviously covering all these things off and also the practical things. Um, uh, I guess a good point to raise is the immediate postpartum after birth and um, if you're still in the space of not really being able to make a decision or think um, so you really need people to just bring you things so be thinking about okay she probably hasn't eaten in 24 hours I'm going to give her a quick um, bliss ball or you know some coconut water just you know being proactive and thinking about about stuff like that I think is a great idea and um, your doula or midwives usually help with the cleanup. Um, so remembering that, especially after the baby's born, the placenta might not be birthed yet, but she's still in the birth process. So keeping that sort of really loving um, sanctuary space, like don't start FaceTiming her mom. Um, like it's just, you know, keeping it, this is still birth, even though the baby's already arrived. Um, once placenta's out, the, that's the third stage of um, labor complete and she'll then be resting, but it's just really important to stay by her side and have this bubble. Um, you might be like, oh God, there's so much to do and I don't want the midwives you know, having to do everything, but just let your team take care of everything um, and you just need to be with your new baby and with your partner, loving on them um, because you do feel incredibly tender um, after giving birth. In more ways than one. <laughs> um, yeah, so thank you, Sam.
uh, for your input. Um, I just quickly go to the questions. Um, so Earth Ethos has asked um, Matt and Sam, so what helped you stay present um, and centered and what were your fears? Oh, is we going? <laughs> um, didn't really have any fears. I was pretty, pretty comfortable with um, the whole situation. Like we had the doula and the midwife. Um, you know, we trusted that they knew what we needed to know. If if something was um, going to go not our way, then they would say, "All right, you know, we've got to pack it up and and head on in." But um, yeah, I wasn't wasn't um, really concerned about anything else. Other than that, um, you know, we were pretty much prepared for it. We had everything laid out. We had a, you know, a kind of a, a structure like Sam was saying, you've got to know the stages of, of what to, you're going to expect. And when you get there, what are we going to try and what are we going to need to do? But other than that, you know, I, I probably built it up more in my head than anything, just going, oh, fuck, man, how bad is this going to be? Um, but yeah, on the day it was fine. Like I was still coming and going when she needed me because sometimes it was just nobody touch her. It was me only and and I had to be there. So I dropped everything, run in, you know, do the hip squeeze for the um, couple of minutes or whatever. And then, you know, I could duck back out and start making dinner or whatever. Um, you know, the, she, all at the time all she wanted was just plain toast. That was um, pretty much all she could really stomach. She didn't want to smell anything. Um, but, um, yeah, I'd say we weren't really, I wasn't terribly concerned, um, about anything really. So, you know, I was pretty calm. Um, I just went through the photos to see the, see the stuff and just for a, have a little bit of a walk down memory lane. It was nice. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I do feel like in terms of fears, just to put my perspective out there that, um, it can be scary with the unknown and the build up to the day of birth. But once you're at the day of birth um, and you're in it, um, just witnessing the absolute perfection of labor and how it usually starts very slowly, very mildly, and allows you know all of these natural pain relieving hormones to be released in the body, and just witnessing her move in a primal manner, I feel like you just build a new sense of um, trust for birth and for women's bodies. Um, and so I do feel like actually witnessing the birthing progress helps to dissolve a lot of fears. It also feels like this is very normal <laughs> and something about birth feels familiar. I know the first time um, I went into labor and I felt those sensations, I, you know, I was like, this doesn't seem as scary as what I made it up in my head you know I was very I was welcoming each each way so um yeah so Sam um to speak to your experience a little bit with Josie the first time did you have you know fears or concerns um with the labor um not not overtly no um it, it, it kind of carrying on from what you were saying about birth and you know there's something familiar about it but that's definitely true mm. and it's there's something it's really primal and it's really kind of magical really it's very amazing to witness it and I feel very uh, privileged because I got to see it in in a in a really stripped down version that a lot of people don't don't get to see and so um it really was uh you know like a it, it's, it's such a natural thing um and it's just about trust it's about trust in nature doing what it does and your partner having all of that equipment with her it's all innate within her so she knows what to do and you in a way even though men haven't been so involved in birth 
we do have instincts, we do have a certain understanding. And even, you know, in the second one, when our, my older boy, he came in, he, he knew what was going on in a way. He was, you know, he was a bit confused or whatever, but he also understood that there was a process happening. There's something going on. And even my dog as well, like that's another thing, an animal, like he understood what was going on. You know, it's, it's, um, it's an amazing thing, you know, and uh, yeah, I don't really have this, you know, that many fears at, at all really. Yeah, that's great. My internet, sorry, I just gotta fix my internet. <laughs> Um, hey, I'm still, <laughs> but I was going to lose it. Um, so on that, we did have a question come in through the um, social media channels on, um, and the question was, how can I convince my husband to be supportive of home birth? Um, I'm not sure if this person is online um, tonight, but I think this is a really common question that, um, that, you know, I get asked as a doula all the time. Um, and my response would be just to have a conversation with him um, about trust. And I know that with the families that I work with, if they make a decision about something, I fully trust that decision because I know that there's no parent out there that would um, make a decision that would ever put, um, you know, themselves or their baby in harm's way. So, um, just helping to realize you, if you have that trust in your partner, um, you're going to be okay. And you know that if she ever feels like things are, um, she needs medical attention, that she will make that call. Um, so, yeah. Um, also, just the weight of responsibility in birth is obviously skewed to the woman because she's the one going through the process. So I feel personally that ultimately the decision lands with the woman and that um, everybody should communicate how they're feeling. But at the end of the day, she's the one that needs to feel safe and respected and loved. Um, and if she doesn't feel that in the hospital, it absolutely will disturb the labour. Um, and so I think helping your husband or partner understand the physiology of birth and how important it is that you do feel safe um, in your chosen birthplace with your chosen team. Um, so we also have a midwife Q&A on tomorrow night at 7.30. If um, any of the men have concerns, it might be great to jump on and um, ask a question of a midwife if it's more of a medical, what if, um, if something arose, what would, what would the situation be there? Um, and another question we got was, um, books to read for dads who'll be supporting a home birth. Now this isn't a, um, a, you know, dad specific book, but I absolutely adore, um, the book, the down to earth birth book by Jenny Blythe. We actually see this, um, on the home website shop. I'm not recording, they're recording. Um, so yeah, if you are looking for a book that will help you understand um, a physiological birth and how to support a woman um, and you know different positioning techniques and comfort measures, it's such a beautiful book. It's a keepsake, something that you'll pass down to your children. Um, so definitely go and check that out. The Down to Earth Birth Book by Jenny Blythe, available on our website. Um, and was there any other questions? Matt and Sam, did you have doulas? I think um, we touched on this, Matt, you had a doula with Jamie. Awesome, well, I think we are at time and if there's no more questions, I might just leave you with, <laughs> how do I do this? <laughs> Thanks, Mel. Um, sharing my screen to give you the QR code for the, share there you go so that's the qr code for the active truth um 
gift card. If you want to take advantage of that, just scan that code now. Um, yeah, but otherwise, thank you. And thanks so much to um, Matt and Sam for jumping on um, and sharing the story with us. And sorry that I put you on the spot, <laughs> but you both did amazing. So thank you very much. No worries. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you. See you later. Bye. Bye.